we're going to have some more readings now of poetry, so I'll hand back over to Maggie. <laughs> now, one of our gigs that we run, um, we used to run it every week, but we've run out of a venue at the moment, so it will start up again soon, but you can certainly catch the performances on YouTube if you look up Rebel Slam. This is a performance gig for uh, younger poets usually um, to actually come along and do a performance and usually at Friendly Street you put poems in the box and you could potentially get published in the anthology. But for the performance poets they get put up on YouTube instead which obviously you can then sell your performances around the place. Now the person that we're going to start off with is a formidable uh, Rebel Slam champion. Royce is a performance poet and also a journalist. He writes for Finger magazine, which if you haven't found this free magazine, please look for it. It's a fantastic one, particularly for young people, but anyone who wants to keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on in Adelaide. Um, he is also the director with Indigo, another performance poet, of a thing called Nameless Project, which if you want to find more about, talk to him at the end. Um, but I will just go ahead and introduce the amazing poet, Royce. Diaspora. That word should resonate in all of us. We are stardust, handfuls of elements and atoms. Each of us has been in existence since before time. Our flesh, once forged in the belly of a bleeding sun, scattered, thrown across galaxies to be collected up again, millions of years later, to be reformed, over, with, and by time, into planets, plants, animals, and person. And inside every person, there's a heat, a beat, a passion that consumes experience like fusion, emits thought like flares, mixes and blends perception and reality in stellar nuclear synthesis like twin turntables that mix and blend gypsy and tarantella beats with electricity, pump it out through speakers, ordering audiences to dance, radiate, generate light. To illuminate entire worlds and abandon behaviours that construct race, class, gender, sexuality, recognising them as black holes that steal the light of every person and reflects nothing. Tear open the skull of any person and find within entire solar systems rotating like the whirling gears of mechanical clocks, rotating as each person thinks and tracks time, tracks time as they orbit their origin and implants memory on membrane. Remember, death may be inevitable, but so is reincarnation. Entire lifetimes are imprinted like the grooves in a vinyl record within memory, upon the purse sun, upon our stardust shell casings, and that memory imprinted stardust is shared with every living creature, planet, and nebula, reborn, reconstituted, returned. And I remember like King Lenon and the third Imam, that supernova, the death throes of suns can outshine entire galaxies. Our ancestors were right to worship the sun because that's where we came from. Before time, when we escaped Eden as bare elements, riding beams of light, riding shotgun and shockwaves, the farthest reaches of space, we belong to the first diaspora. We are all one. Now, my name is Royce. As I, as I said, I'm a performance poet. I'm sorry I didn't say hello before. I find it really awkward. I come out here, say hello. You guys look at me. It gets kind of weird. But um, so I liked, and that poem was particularly by, um, was heavily inspired by a performance poet from America who's also an actor, writer, artist, musician, does many things. His name is Saul Williams. I suggest everyone go on YouTube, check him out. He is fantastic. Um, the poem in, by name is Coded Language. And he says something really interesting in that poem. It's a quote that I love. He says, We stand as the manifest equivalent of three buckets of water and a handful of minerals, thereby realizing that those same buckets turned upside down provide the percussive factor of forever. And it's such a profound way of looking at, well, us. <coughs> but what I really like to like write about is life, existence, you know, stuff. Talking about this reality splits people down the middle like a bandsaw. Either it's exposed veins and rotting tracks or sheets of satin sunlight and curling incense. 
As if Opie and Poppies aren't just the angsty, misunderstood teens of the flower world looking for a hug. If they knew what horrors their future might hold, they would cut themselves. Just once, I'd like people reading newspapers to think twice before they start asking the world, what, asking the air what this world is coming to. These five senses can never quite grasp this reality anyway, can never quite weave silk from the threads of all this. But if we're going to start talking about reality, let's start by keeping it real. I'm a 20-something-year-old wannabe poet. Where I come from, people grow up to become waitresses, factory workers, and laborers. I've seen graveyards for dreams filled with actresses, doctors, engineers stuck in the gum beneath tabletops and forgotten. But the weekends, the weekends are still all bonfires, empty bottles, and wide smiles, all whirling planets and smashing atoms. It's all physics. Cracked and strained eyes witnessing the big bang of falling apples and <laughs> expressed as the chalk dust footprints left on blackboards, expressed as metal engines harnessing explosions, driving these pistons onward, keeping this thing on the road, getting ready for Monday, the on and off clock of Monday morning's nine to five time card cycle. But see, most can't do the math. They keep losing numbers, keep having problems with the process. Truth is, all this, it's a little more chemistry than physics. A little more outlaw than profit. A little more the smell of burning tobacco and a swig of tequila from the bottle than spectacled mathematician trying to reverse engineer the universe by decoding the language of God. The truth is, this is about the substance. It's about the smell of bacon and eggs first thing on a Sunday morning and toast. <laughs> toast made from fresh bread, thick crust, and melted butter and coffee, the smell of hot, strong coffee, black as pitch, black as charcoal, black as death. Mixed with one milk, but one sugar and a dash of milk, stirred really, really well. Watch the steam rising up the surface. Take that first sip of hot liquid, feel it slide across the tongue and hit the back of the throat. This is about leather and chains of highly refined hydrocarbons uh, crackling in the exhaust of the motorcycle and about the pepper spray used sub to subdue the man who rides it. This is about the orange and red of leaves in autumn, the purple of flowers on a jacaranda tree and the smell of freshly cut grass. This is about the oil slick rainbows left in parking lots and the stuff billiard balls are made of. This is about sex. No control, being driven, pushed forward, two bare elements and a holding of breath. <gasps> this is about knowing how the cake is made and eating it too. About keeping the fire burning long into the AM. About how for every OD junkie, there's a little kid crying over a shot of vaccine. About how for every rattling engine, there is no reverse. And for every dead dream, there's all this. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize for nearly slipping the line there. I've rehearsed enough, I should get it. But anyway, now next is not necessarily, not necessarily science related. But when you're talking about life, existence, enjoying the little things, isn't that what science is about? Understanding how the world works, understanding how things are formed, what the, just understanding. Screaming abuse at TV screens doesn't change the facts. And the, Facts are like this. We are born into this world with a slap on the ass. No one cares except those few precious people discovered like diamonds through time and hard labor. Together we do stupid things and laugh at each other and we grow old together. I don't know much about anything, but I know it's this kind of thinking that can send you looking for God. But it seems to me that seven days into the job, the people in charge got bored and went drinking, leaving us with nothing but these precious moments that mean everything. And if you don't believe me, keep looking. But I can promise you life never works the way you want it to. So with that in mind, every day I wake, I hold my breath. Pick it up in my hands and turn it over with my fingers so I can feel it. Can you feel it? Can you feel it manifest in the silhouettes at the end of your bed with teeth like drill bits and claws like razors? Blankets can't keep out demons, but hold them over your head anyway so you at least don't have to see what happens next. Don't look. Just know. Those monsters are only shadows. And a person's history is written in their shadow like old books. 
open them wide and smell the pages and find within tales of failed relationships and shine a new babes blinding bright like the high beams in your rear view mirror. High beams like the stairs of the kids you used to pick on in school for not being the same before you decided it was cooler to be different. Shadows are storytellers. Like the man who once told you about that time he found himself standing on a bridge with a rope. But the only thing that ran through his mind in those moments was the word, no. Shadows scream, screams of joy and screams of frustration, and sometimes they laugh. And you should listen to that laughter because laughter echoes through time like the smile of two little kids in a sandpit with muddied hands. Smile back. Smile back and turn the page. Turn the page and find a blank. And remember that tomorrow only writes the next chapter in the story. And I know you want to know what happens next. So hold your breath. Put it up in your hands. Turn it over your fingers so you can feel it. And look into my eyes. Because we're stepping off that ledge into tomorrow so quickly. People are going to think we're mad. And thank you. That's all for me. Now, we did have a poet who was going to be uh, performing now, but Janine has unfortunately be, been taken ill and gone home. And so instead of that, we've got Rob Walker reading one from our latest anthology. This is where you get published if you come along and read at Friendly Street. We usually get about a 1,000 poems in the box over the course of a year, and uh, there's only 100 pages. So you can imagine quite good poems get in here. So Rob Walker is going to read one from this for us. So thanks, Rob, for coming. He's a performance poet. He's got a fantastic website, Rob Walker. Uh, definitely check him out because he loves music and poetry normally. Thank you. It won't be half as good as Royce's because I haven't uh, memorised it. It's a poem about optimism. It's called A Better World. Just like you to imagine. Money is mute. Humility talks. Landmines are consumed by dung beetles overnight. People have the confidence of cats, the loyalty of dogs. Every word is a dollar to be spent wisely. Every child is declared a national treasure. Children conduct workshops for parents on spontaneity and optimism. Conformity is tolerated, uniqueness celebrated. Thank you. You can tell by the hat, he's a really cool dude poet, can't you? <laughs> oh, don't say that. The cool dude was better. <laughs> I'm going to read a few of my poems now. And I talked about potential energy before, and this is now about matter. There's something safe about matter. It has mass. It occupies space. Curiosity requires chemists to ask questions about the composition and character of matter and any changes that might occur. Detective work, interrogation of the facts, the material facts of reality. Chemists are the Sherlock Holmes of rational reason, the K. Scar Petters of forensic detail, the wild coyote leaps of Harry Bosch. The crime scene of matter is investigated by skilled observers, recording impeccable facts, accurate measurement, writing in precise language so it can be re examined and reviewed until someone asking the random question in that dishevelled Columbo kind of way reveals a moment of discovery. This is no sleepy hollow Miss Mar Marple village, no jolly, awfully ethical, cute and cosy Angela Lansbury world of summer bay. The state of matter can change from rock to solid to more fluid and even gas. Matter's heart can melt or boil over with rage. It can freeze completely, seem cruel and bare, create condensation like hot passion steaming in a hot car. But without energy, matter is lost. It needs heat, light, electricity and movement to thrive, to just get going, to be able to change and even to have potential. Because apart from chemistry, it's also about forestry this year, I'm going to read one which is about a very unpopular tree in Australia called the poplar tree. And it's because of very fond memories of mine. Poplar. 
Whitley Park infants and primary schools surrounded by a poplar border. Lombardy poplars, elongated forefingers pointing high to the sky, hugging their branches to themselves. They grow so fast, Napoleon planted them on his military roads, invasion roads, stretching through Europe, performing perf uh, forming perfect painting and photo opportunities. Straight roads bound by tapering lines of tall, sky-reaching poplars seeking the horizontal vanishing point, far, far into the distant dimensional illusion of a flat, taut canvas. Berkshire is full of them, always erupting through pipe prisons, tarmac, cement and concrete surfaces. They're tough, certain and resilient. It's their whispering sounds in the slightest breeze sets them rustling with secrets. In a storm, they're a rushing waterfall of wisdom and knowledge. They're wood, very light, soft and pale, easy to carve and hollow out for clogs and frames of Celtic shields with leather tautened and bark hard. Now they only pulp to set cellulose or make plywood and redheads. Their dark brown buds swell in spring, so vigorous the whole tree is full. Leaves are reddish brown in May, while other trees are spring green. In northern summer, the leaves lighten to green, then soften to a sweet yellow and squelch underfoot when autumn falls. Then comes my strongest memory of that rich, humid scent of leaves, rotting with succulently heady perfume like no other that means home to me. In Adelaide, I found that scent again at the university as I crossed the grass in front of Elder Hall, standing tall beside the Benithan's Castle Folly, a grove of poplars, perfect for smelling in June and July as I crossed towards the Napier, that nightmare block of 60s gloom. It was my saddest day to see them dug up, roots exposed, their earthy death, and the smell hung in the air for a week or more before the earth movers and the JCBs scoured the landscape and scarred it to moonscape. Now it's tiled and tizzied up with tiny trees, perfect backdrops for graduation photos. No shade or shadow to overhang or just a bleached barren courtyard. In summer, I still sit under the one remaining Morton Bay fig, cool beneath its continental spread of branches, and remember that grove of poplars. One more thing lost in the payers you learn, one shop degree shop with its hustle bustle, iPhones stinging. There's no one can listen to the rustle of secrets alive in the leaves, lying silent in the soft green grass. And just two shorter, less sort of serious ones. That's a bit sentimental and soft, I guess. The love of colloids. In front of a Malleroot fire under a canopy of stars, as you bite into the white, jelloid, gluey gump of soft, squishy marshmallow, you need to know it's a colloid of gas and a solid. And if in Venezia at Florian's in Piazza San Marco, your hot chocolate, bitter and sweet, silky smooth, sliding sensually down your throat, is topped and tipped with whipped cream. Remember, that too is a colloid of gas, but in a liquid. As you drive back from the Adelaide Hills, riding down to the neon plains, you can be encircled by mystery of fog and strangely see your headlight beams the Tyndale effect, is evident of a liquid in a gas colloid. And even smoke is just a colloid of solid ash or soot caught in the gas of air. The taste, the texture, sublime, the magic mystery of illusion, all the tricks of colloid in between us. Not quite suspension nor solution. <laughs> and the final one, I'm doing a bit of rehabilitating of carbon too. And this is, of course, dedicated, I'm sorry if you're politically inclined, dedicated to the mad monk and the bolt. Carbon-14. I love radioactive dating with carbon-14. 
Alive, you are so constant, dead, so predictable, decreasing your intensity to a half-life of 5,730 years. Historians and archaeologists adore you. You unlock miracles shrouded in mystery. You put the kibosh on the tosh the fundos love to preach about the past they teach. But you, darling Carbon-14, you let us reach right back to that big cons cosmic bang well beyond our imagination. And that's all. Thank you very much.